Although government-funded population control programs can be found in white schools, the evidence is that they are significantly more likely to be targeted at black schools. One example of this was seen in 1986, when it was discovered that Illinois public schools were not only distributing birth control to children, but that every one of the 50 facilities involved were in minority neighborhoods. When this information was made public, a local African-American pastor organized a campaign to stop the program. Reverend Hiram Crawford labeled the project genocide, saying that the obvious goal was to go after the Hispanic and black population. That same pattern was also found in Maryland in the 1990s. Even though the state's teen pregnancy rate was higher among white students than black students, when the contraceptive device Norplant was introduced, it was selectively marketed to children as young as 13 in predominantly black schools in Baltimore. The result was that of the first 350 girls implanted at a local middle school, 345 were African American. Then, when Norplant was approved for general distribution, of the first 100 schools selected, all 100 were in minority neighborhoods. The Norplant contraception device was developed by the Population Council in New York, which had been established in 1952 under the leadership of its president, John Rockefeller. Its next two presidents, Frederick Osborne and Frank Notstein, were both former members of the American Eugenics Society and Notstein would later serve on the National Advisory Council of Planned Parenthood. If you're going to curb population, it's extremely important not to have it done by the damn Yankees, but by the UN. Because the thing is, then it's not considered genocide. If the United States goes to the black man or the yellow man and says, slow down your reproductive rate, we're immediately suspected of having ulterior motives to keep the white man dominant in the world. If you can send in a colorful UN force, you've got much better leverage. Alan Guttmacher, president of Planned Parenthood and former vice president of the American Eugenics Society, 1970. Four years after Guttmacher made that statement, America's National Security Council issued a report that was intended to define the United States government's official policy on controlling world population. It was called the National Security Study Memorandum 200, or NSSM 200, and it was formulated in cooperation with the United States Agency for International Development, the U.S. State Department, the Department of Defense, and the Central Intelligence Agency. One of its goals was to establish a strategy for reducing the populations of third world countries so that the United States could have increased access to their natural resources, particularly minerals and metals. Among the conclusions of NSSM 200 was that no country has reduced its population growth without resorting to abortion. The authors of the report then identified three non-governmental agencies that would be funded to carry out the government's population control agenda in the targeted countries. One of those agencies was Planned Parenthood. One of the tactics specified in NSSM 200 was that we might withhold food aid after a disaster if the countries do not accept the American idea of birth control. And this has happened many times all over the world. One example is the uh, southern American country of Guyana, which was hit by a hurricane back in 1997. Now, they had turned down abortion and birth control for 12 years straight, but after the hurricane hit Guyana in 1997, the World Bank said, we will not give you any aid unless you legalize abortion and birth control, and that's exactly what they did. And I've seen this several times in Africa, where droughts have hit, and the United Nations and USAID will not assist unless they accept birth control. I've been all through Africa myself and I've seen medical clinics that are full of birth control devices but no safe motherhood delivery kits. There's no uh, anesthesia, there's not even any bandages there. There's crates and crates of birth control bills and condoms. Now while our commitment to birth control is going up every year, our commitment to authentic economic development is dropping. So we see less uh, clean drinking water funding, uh, less school funding, uh, see less medical clinic funding. Another example is Haiti. Uh, Haiti has been hit by hurricanes several times, 
and uh, the United States and other countries are saturated with birth control. In Haiti now, any woman, 90% of women at least, can now get access to any kind of birth control they want to, government funded, but less than 20% of the Haitians have access to clean drinking water. Now try to imagine there being a natural catastrophe in a country like Canada or Australia or France or England. And we go in there and we say to them, we're not going to offer you any kind of aid unless you accept our philosophy on birth control and population control. That will be outrageous. But that's our standard operating procedure when we go to a black country after a catastrophe of some kind. You cannot believe that we are going to treat people in a foreign country like this and not treat our own population of African Americans the same way. Consider what happened after Hurricane Katrina. One of the first things we did was bring in birth control and contraception. And as we all know, the hurricane disproportionately affected black families in that area. And I seriously doubt if the same kind of disaster hit a middle-class white area, the first response would be condoms and birth control. This idea that population control could be used to control a specific population was not unique to NSSM 200. For example, before the Nazis took power in Germany, abortion had been illegal except to save the life of the mother. But under Hitler, the Hamburg Eugenics Court ruled that it would still be illegal for Aryan women, but legal for women of what they called inferior racial stock. According to the court, encouraging eugenic abortions would promote racial hygiene and protect the health of the German people. This new policy eventually led to certain women being threatened with execution if they refused to abort what the Nazis called racially worthless babies. At about the same time this was going on in Germany, the government of Bermuda was blanketing the island with population control facilities and openly stating that their intent was to limit the numbers of blacks. Then in 1958, blacks in the Caribbean rebelled against a Planned Parenthood-led birth control campaign that was exclusively targeted at non-white residents, while at the same time, prosperous white residents were being encouraged to multiply. Following a similar pattern, a 1965 article in the Pittsburgh Courier newspaper reported that under apartheid, the white South African government was relying on targeted birth control as its primary weapon to reduce the number of blacks in the country. Unfortunately, we now know that the U.S. government was not immune to this sort of thing either. When three pro-choice researchers investigated the original motive behind the creation of the abortion pill, RU486, what they discovered was that the scientific basis for it was actually developed in the United States during the 1960s by the National Institutes of Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In their 1991 book, these researchers claimed to have found data showing that this agency was looking for an inexpensive and effective drug to control the populations of foreign countries that the government had classified as underdeveloped. The abortion pill was to be tested in these environments and, if successful, the plan called for it to then be introduced into black, Hispanic, and Native American communities in the United States. In 1977, only three years after NSSM 200 was issued, the director of the United States Office of Population, Dr. Reimert T. Ravenholt, publicly stated that it was the U.S. government's intention to sterilize one-fourth of the world's female population. According to Ravenholt, one of the driving forces behind this campaign was the need to protect American financial and commercial interests. Ravenholt said that some foreign governments were refusing to give the United States permission to come into their country and control their population. He said that, in those cases, the plan was to be carried out by two private organizations with an enormous amount of financial support from the American government. When asked by a St. Louis newspaper to name the two organizations, he said that they were the United Nations Fund for Population Activities and Planned Parenthood. Among government officials who supported the Ravenholt philosophy of using American intervention to control the populations of foreign countries, perhaps the most powerful were Republican President